to all of you where well, we hope you'll enjoy the show. friends and welcome to another episode of area 312 rock and metal podcast i'm one of your hosts kent along with my co-hosts rex and mike rex and mike friends today it's a we have two big celebrations um we are welcoming dean and cindy westacott from bendale bible chapel and we'll go and welcome westacott's Thank you. Nice to be yeah. here. This is like the family feud. And on the other side, we have <laughs> the Daniel Band family. No, we also have Mr. Tony Rossi and Dan McKay from Daniel Band. Welcome, gentlemen. Greetings. <laughs> Greetings to all. Salutations. <laughs> Friends, today what we're celebrating is the 40th anniversary of a classic album on rock released in 1982. And we're also celebrating the golden anniversary of One Way In um, in 50 years. That's pretty amazing. So we're just going to delve right in. And I'd like to start out, Mr. Dean, Miss Cindy, and, and speaking a little bit about uh, One Way In. I do want to mention, friends, really quick, here in a little bit, we're going to do a deep dive. There's going to be a live stream event celebrating both on October 22nd, celebrating the 50th of One Way In and the 40th of On Rock. And we will discuss, uh, so stay tuned, because in a little bit, we're going to discuss that in depth. So, so you won't want to miss this live stream event. So Mr. Dean and Miss Cindy, um, this is a no trick, uh, all treat episode. It'll be airing uh, October the 8th. By the time you are viewers see this, today is the 10th of September. Um, the beauty of Christian fellowship. Are y'all familiar with Res Band? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. We used to have them come up and, and do concerts, yeah. Exactly. And so I knew that, you know, even on On Rock, Mr. Dan, Mr. Tony, I knew that they kind of uh, fellowship with you guys, uh, Roger Heiss and, and Mr. Glenn, Glenn Kaiser. Um, just, I'm that guy that scours the liner notes of every album. And just like when I read a Res Band album, I know that it's going to say something about Japusa in there. And so since 1982, since my very first Daniel Band cassette tape that I bought back then, it always had the names of Bendale Bible Chapel, the elders at Bendale Bible Chapel, and uh, One Way In Coffee House, and Dean and Cindy Westacott. And so that's kind of special because I feel like there's a connection there because I've been reading about you guys for all these years. Mr. Dean, Miss Cindy, Please talk about the connection with Bendale Bible Chapel in One Way In. Please describe each and when each began. Okay. All right. You well, I, I, I assume Cindy would want me to start because I'm older. Um, <laughs> just just a little just bit. A just a little bit. Um, Benda Bible Chapel is in Toronto, Canada, Toronto, Ontario, um, or in Scarborough, or what's often referred to as Scarberia, I suppose is what it's been called. Um, but Benda Bible Chapel has been there since the late 50s. Um, but in 1971, and I was not actually part of this a small group of people. They're a group of about eight or nine people who really felt that it would be important to have a coffee house. And back in those days, coffee houses were a big thing. Everything's slow to come to Canada. So this was a few years later than sort of the start of coffee houses in the States. Uh, but this group of people thought it'd be great to have a coffee house. And, and so they went to the elders of the church. I wasn't an elder at the time. I was too young. I was actually in my uh, second last year of high school. Uh, when they went to the elders and they talked to them about the possibilities of having a coffee house, talked about having uh, Christian bands play in the church basement. The elders at the time, and I would say a very progressive group of men, um, 
at that time, but they were quite uncertain about this whole idea about having kids coming into the church building and maybe they were into drugs and alcohol and other kinds of things, um, besides the kids who were in the youth group. And the elders were somewhat apprehensive, but but this group, they felt very, very strongly um, about this. And the elders simply said, look, we, we want to encourage you to go and pray about this more and plan more, which they did. A, a wonderful group of people. And they came back to the elders, I believe, about six months later and just said, we just really feel strongly uh, they received the approval of the elders. Uh, the approval of the elders was, it was really about using the building. Um, and we all know at that particular period of time, the notion of having Christian rock music, which a lot of people didn't believe Christian rock music. Oh, how my, you know, my goodness, put those things in the same sentence. Uh, the, the elders recognized not so much that they were worried that they would be viewed badly or our church would be viewed badly, but it was a sort of an inter interesting period of time. Um, and that's why they were somewhat hesitant about the music style and that kind of thing, but also about the potential of the kind of people who would come in the building. But, but they, they agreed and said, let's go with it. And so in September 1972, uh, I'll say it was the 12th, could have been the 17th. I should have planned better <laughs> and pulled out the date. Uh, they had that very first coffee house uh, with a band called Maxima Pax. And they were the furthest thing from rock music but they were dedicated. They were certainly some uh, sincere people. Uh, the year prior to that, because I think this is really important, uh, that group of people who planned the coffee has got people like me, a, a group of us who are in high school, recognizing that we would be inviting our friends, certainly, uh, from school. Uh, we would meet together. We studied F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, uh, New Testament documents. It sounds kind of unusual when you think high school kids studying that book. Uh, we studied the classic um, how to Give Away Your Faith by Paul Little and some other books. Also had uh, individuals come in, come in and do Bible studies and did tons and tons of prayer about this thing. So there's all that prep stuff. And so when I was in grade 12, it was uh, that September of 1972 that uh, One We started. And so that sort of gives you the background in terms of Bendale. Bendale, by the way, I should say, um, at that time, I guess you would say Bendale was brethren. It's brethren roots. Bendale was pretty... Pretty brethren, I guess you'd say. Um, you know, women should wear head coverings. Uh, women shouldn't sort of speak in, in the church services. And so if you take that, yet still progressive, and this desire to have this type of music and to sort of do this kind of thing, they really are to be commended in terms of this kind of uh, progressive. Bendel's still sort of in that framework of, I guess what you'd call brethren history, that we've come a long way. Cindy's the pastor at Bendel, and so you can, if you think about the transition that's happened over that period of time. A uh, lot of changes. <laughs> but but really, uh, I, I think Dan and, and Tony would agree, um, the people at Bendel, not just the leadership, but the people at Bendel, they invested their lives in youth in the community, mm -hmm. and certainly one way in, and inevitably Daniel Bent. Uh, Dean, uh, I just want to ask real quick, now you said that while they were starting this um, and you were in high school and you came to these Bible studies, um, what was your story at that time? Had you been brought up in the faith? What, uh, what yeah, uh, you know? yeah uh, my personal background, this is really fascinating, I suppose, in some ways, but we don't want to get preoccupied with, with me, obviously. Um, I started to attend Benda Bible Chapel uh, with my mother. I'm from a family of eight children. Um, when I was about six years old, I'm now 67, so I've been there forever, I guess you'd say. Um, prior to my mother coming to faith, my parents uh, were Jehovah's Witnesses for a short period of time and, and, and some other things, but inevitably my mother came to faith in Christ. Uh, my dad, a few years later, came to faith in Christ, but Bendale became our church home as a family when I was about, about six years old. And I have never left Bendale. So, so for me as a teenager, um, you know, I was, you know, certainly raised within that church and within the Christian faith. Okay. Mr. Dean and Miss Cindy, I, <clears throat> at a church I went to before I got married, back when I was a little younger and, and single, um, we transformed it every Friday night or sanctuary into a coffee house and it just the floodgates were open and people came and the uh, uh, the adults at the church they made homemade desserts and we had great quality coffee and it was a wonderful time we had music um, 
and that was this was in the very late nineties in in bear well yeah very late nineties but it was just we transformed it on Friday night and then Saturday was cleanup day and then Sunday of course the sanctuary sanctuary is back to normal was was one way in um, was it strictly a weekend coffee house and youth and concert venue or was it open every day. No, it was it was Friday nights, so we'd be you know we'd be uh, getting things set up um, on a Friday night, sometimes a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm trying to remember if we ever did Thursday night setup, but um, you know that was we'd have bands coming on at at eight thirty at night. Um, it was and, a church basement. Yeah, I think is important to note. Yeah, and. Uh, and so, you know, cleanup was very, very late. Like sometimes I guess we'd get home at two in the morning and then there'd be things on Saturdays, like there might be a Bible study or there might be more of a, a youth group thing happening. And then on Sundays after church, uh, there was often either a, a committee meeting, uh, you know, uh, to, to be working on what's coming up next or a prayer meeting. So it, there was a lot. Um, and, and things have kind of have morphed into different things now. We have a drop-in center. Um, and so we have, uh, everything has to be rolled out and rolled back in, but now it's ping pong tables and pool tables and video game systems. So that type of thing, and still open for the community. So roughly what, uh, I, I'm not familiar with your facility there, Cindy, roughly what, how many people could this uh, basement hold? What was the attendance like? Uh, was it always, at maximum capacity once you guys got going with people coming and checking out everything? Well, we, we were kind of over capacity. Um, we did do an expansion in 1983. Uh, we, we did have people packed in, uh, as Tony and Dan will remember, there, there were nights that were very tight and uh, the fire marshal let us know that, uh, that we were over capacity. And so that, that was the, um, the catalyst for the building program. And so in 83, we did add on. I was talking to teens last night about this, showing them some PowerPoint, uh, some slides on PowerPoint from the last 50 years. And I said, see this part? And see this part of the building? This, was, this did not exist. And, you know, they could see how the crowds were packed into this, this smaller area. So, yeah, we were, we were pretty packed out. We should say that the, you're wondering about the fire marshal. It's not like he came to check us out. His daughter attended. And uh, she had talked about, you know, the place and everything else. And he popped in at one point and he noticed that the place was jammed and people up the stairs and sitting up the stairs and sometimes even further. I mean, let's face it. You don't have to be in the room to hear Daniel Band or uh, other bands. <laughs> so, um, that's for sure. You know, and the back door—the back doors were always open, so you could always sit out in the back. You know, the back hill, and 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 you could be up the street, up at the corner, and still hear the band too. So, um, but yeah, the place was packed. I mean, it was packed in the early years. It was uh, stuffed cushions on the floor with with um, tables, low tables, low tables, and then chairs at the back, and and uh, with tables and our classic coffee house. It was actually a table that we built sides on and put a little roof on and- The coffee shack. The coffee shack and had the classic in those days, certainly in Toronto, pop shop pop. I'm not sure it was good coffee, but <laughs> you know, donuts and stuff like that, so. If you're standing on the rock, the winds will never break you. Cindy, um, if you could, I mean, Dean talked a little bit about his early history with it. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you came into it and maybe how you guys got together? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, I was, I was attending another church at the time. Uh, a Baptist church in the area, and uh, but I came to to Coffee House, and I made the transition uh, at age seventeen to to come to Bendale, and uh, I guess just 
been super involved ever since. Uh, so, you know, I, I became a Christian at an early age. My parents uh, and my grandparents were believers. So, uh, you know, I was really blessed to have this Christian heritage and uh, just really excited about the Lord and really excited to, to come to Bendale and immediately get involved at, at age 17 with, uh, with Coffee House. So, um, and then Dean and I ended up, uh, we were teaching in, a, well, I mean, we got, we got married. Uh, I was, it was right after first year university for me. Dean was teaching. Um, you know, God just told me uh, first first night that I, I went to. <laughs> I won't want to sidetrack this too much, but um, the first night that I came to Bendale after I had I had handed in my membership uh, on the Sunday morning at at uh, the Baptist Church, and came. There were still Sunday evening services then. Uh, Dean was chairing. And, and I was holding a hymn book and just God spoke to me and just said, you know, this is the guy you're going to marry. And I practically dropped the hymn book. God didn't tell me, by I, the way, at I, the time. I, I didn't know <laughs> And, uh, and then we were in, all invited, all the youth were invited to um, one of the elders and, and his wife, uh, their home across the street. And apparently, I guess, you know, people noticed that I kind of stuck to Dean like glue. Uh, next morning. Yeah, I noticed too. It's pretty <laughs> awkward, actually. <laughs> uh, next morning at school, I, I told a couple of my friends, a couple of guys, you know, I'm getting married. And they were like, we didn't even know you were dating anybody. I said, oh, well, I'm not yet. But but we'll be getting married, and and so yeah, so Dean Dean invited me out. Yeah, I should give them my little little bit of backstory. Not that we want to go down the how we met and all the romance and everything but else. You did ask, yeah. Um, but you know, I did ask Cindy out. But the backstory to that was uh, on a number of occasions I woke up in the middle of the night dreaming about her, and it was kind of bizarre because I don't remember dreams, let alone dreaming about girls. And um, no, you were shy. Yeah, I was shy to say the least. I yes, to say the least. Um, and, and it was kind of bizarre. And, and I'm being, I'm saying this in all sincerity. I just thought, my goodness, I'm not going to sleep properly. I should ask the girl out. Cindy's going to say no, and then I'll be able to sleep. And I'm being sincere. That's kind of my 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 view. And so I asked her out. At least I'm reasonably intelligent because uh, it was the university uh, group at the University of Toronto, they were going figure skating and then to go sing Christmas carols at a senior's home. And I figured she didn't look particularly athletic. So if she said yes, then she'd have to hold my hand when we when we went skating. Uh, but I assumed she'd say no. And uh, so I asked her and she said yes. And then it was like, oh my gosh, and I haven't slept since. No, I, I say that. <laughs> <laughs> I say that in fun. So. And I asked him to marry me two weeks later. Yes. I was in grade 12. And I, I just assumed God told him that we were getting married. So I, I dragged out a calendar and said, what date did you like? And and he walked all the way home being, Dan's mouth just <laughs> fell over. Oh my goodness. Guys, oh, did you know, what, that, what just happened? Said, he said yeah. he just going to ask her because he knew she'd say no and he could Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's interesting because, and maybe we could sort of end at this point with it perhaps, uh, but it was really interesting because, when we sort of talked after this, she asked me to marry her and all that kind of stuff. And we sort of had a conversation. Um, she said, well, she explained how God told her. And she said, well, didn't God tell you? And I said, no. She said, well, why did you ask me out? And I told her about the dreams. And she said, well, then that, that those dreams are actually visions from God. And I think that's probably very legit. I mean, I think that was a God thing that was going on there. Um, well, that is so that is how God handled it with Joseph. You know, so. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. But I, you know, I wasn't smart <laughs> enough to get it. So, anyway. so you know, then we we ended up uh, both teaching at People's Christian Academy, and then uh, and then the elders at Bendale asked us to uh, work there in pastoral ministry. We were the first people to do that full time, and then Dean has since returned to teaching at People's, and I've continued on. Um, as the pastor there so uh yeah so that's that's our story that's that's wonderful that's awesome um so mr dean miss cindy mr tony mr dan in your all's words what is the connection with daniel band and bendale slash one way in um did the band or does some of the band members i don't know about mr bill mr bill finley does anybody still attend bendale or what was the connection there between the band and one way in or Bendale Bible Chapel? Well, when I, when I was a youth, uh, I'd say uh, first year university, uh, 
I discovered a place that had rock music. I loved rock music. That's what I was listening to. And they were Christians, which was great because I got to hear stuff that I, music, the style that I liked with the lyrics that I liked. So uh, it became an institution for me. Every Friday night, I had to be at Bend. I, I just loved One Way In so much. And I, I have a lot of friends that I connected with at that time. And I still see them to this day. And we, we, were, we were here at my house a few weeks ago. And we were all saying, we were all saying that was a golden era for us. Um, getting together every Friday night, a bunch of us. And going out after the g and this little restaurant nearby. Yes, yes, and, uh, absolutely. We look back to that. And I remember thinking, is there anything like that for youth nowadays? I hope there is somewhere. Um, but I, we were just so lucky. I, I get, Maybe that's the word I could use. Blessed would be a better word. That, that, that Dean and Cindy and others like them put this together and, and put in the effort and had, and had this vision. Because it really blessed a lot of youth. And a lot of us are still walking with God to this day. It had long-term impact on so many people. You know, so, and um I used to go and watch a band named Harvest. Uh, they were one of my favorite bands that played there. And they broke up once. Uh, and I never hadn't seen it for a long time. And I met one of the guys named Dan Robbins. And I said to him, I haven't seen your band in a while. Um, what, are you, what are you guys up to? He said, well, we broke up. And I said to him, well, why don't you get back together again? And I'll play guitar for you. And he didn't know who I was. But they, he took me up on it. We got back together again. So the next thing I know, I'm now playing in Harvest, and I'm playing at One Way In. And that was just a thrill for me. To, I used to go there to watch my stomach. Now I'm playing in a band at One Way In. For me, that was really exciting. And uh, we were playing there one night, and I saw another band named Mana. And I saw I, th I saw this lead singer. I thought, man, can that guy sing? What pipes he's got? And it was this guy right here, Dan McCabe, <laughs> singing with his brother. And uh, somehow um, we got together, we, and uh, we've been playing together and singing together ever since. And uh, it's, it's been... Uh, just a, a great relationship and, and a great time to be in Daniel Band. It's a real honor for me. Real, and a great, great pleasure. Great joy. Let, let me pick up on what Tony said. We had the same thing. I, I, I was raised in a in a very close brethren background in the church that I went to. Right till I was 18 years old, they didn't have a piano or organ in the church, and so I kind of figured. And I may have said this in other interviews, but I, I figured there was nothing for me to do in ministry as a Christian. And so there was this girl that invited me out to the coffee house. And I went and went to the coffee house and saw this group called Harvest playing. And Tony Rossi was the guitar player in it. And I'm going, can you do that and be a Christian? You know? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Most people would say no. <laughs> so uh, I thought, wow, this is really something. So my brother and I started this group called Mana, And we ended up uh, opening up on October the 5th. Uh, I forget what year it was. It was October the 5th, though. For Harvest, which was my dream come true, because I looked at Harvest as, wow, that band is unbelievable. The guitar player is incredible. They're just such a well put together band. And so, uh, you know, that's where Tony got to see me singing. And then eventually, I ended up in Harvest as the keyboard player. So Tony said, well, they need a keyboard player. And Tony said, well, I know a guy who can play keyboard. So I ended up in Harvest with as a keyboard player. And then eventually harvest started to wind down and Tony and I looked at each other going, well, you know, do you want to do something? You know, we, we started, we just, we just kept on going just without kept him. Going, right. We Taking were, a lot we, of cancellations. We, we were little harvest for a, for a few, few months. Little harvest. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, you know, it comes back to the fact that if, if that place, Bendale Bible Chapel and the one way in wasn't there, none of this would happen. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, Very influential I, uh, place that is. Part of that blessing. Can I ask Cindy a question. Cindy, can you hear me? I, I missed that last little bit. I asked you a question. Okay. Did Bendil used to not have pastors, and now they do have a pastor? Because I remember thinking yes. uh, at, at Brethren Chapels, you just have elders and no pastor. But you just, you just right. I didn't know. I haven't seen you in a long time. Are you not yeah. that? They, the yeah. Thing? In in the last few years, because you know when when Dean left, I was still uh, you know doing all the things with the youth, and Dean was still doing a lot, even though he was back in teaching. Um, you know, because we still you know have that that teamwork going. Um, but I was all, I also kind of inherited all the, the chunks of work that Dean was doing as well. Um, and so a few years ago, the leadership team suggested that we change my title from youth director uh, to simply pastor. And it's not something that I throw around, like I'm not into titles. Um, sometimes it comes in handy if you're at a hospital and you need to get in, you know, sure. a hospital pass, you know, I'm the pastor. Uh, but it's not something that I generally use. I would say that there's lots of people at the church who wouldn't even know, unless they go to the website or something, you 
know, we don't have a, a bulletin right now. So it's not like in your face at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause you know, we work as a family. Um, right. Mendel's not political at, at all. No. And, and is there so, an assistant pastor? Are you the only pastor? Saying? No, I, yeah, the, I'm the only employee other than having a caretaker. Um, and so, and, and it's only been in the last few years that, that they have come to the point of letting women preach. So I've, you yes, know, I, I know, so it's a shared, it's a, it's a shared pulpit and, and I'm just so grateful because there have been sermons within my heart and of course I had lots of opportunities with with the many youth programs and teaching Sunday school and I, I write the curriculums for it and that but um, just to be able to share openly of course we've been able to share openly in communion for decades now um, and and we lead worship sometimes so there's freedom there and sharing and I uh, could do anything in communion but having the opportunity to share God's word that's been just burning in my heart uh, one I'm doing in October that that sermon's been in my head for 40 years so i'm excited yeah. excellent. excellent and i think what's just to get a sort of a bit of background you know when you think about bendale back in 72 or even go further back but 72 if we're connecting with one way in uh, the elders at bendale men um they were never anti-women per se um in that sense. And there was always that sort of progressive piece, even though within a brethren framework, it may not be particularly progressive. But if we look at many churches, even today, over that period of time, um, they hire the pastor, not the couple, because that's the dynamic. And so when we were asked to leave teaching, um, it was made really, really clear to us by this group of elders that Dean we want you guys as a couple. Mm -hmm. And if you guys as a couple aren't willing to leave teaching and to be full-time in full-time pastoral ministry, but they didn't call us pastors. They didn't use that title. We were, you know, in full-time ministry together. They said, we want both of you or none of you. And I didn't take that as an insult. Uh, that mm -hmm. was really their way of expressing, um, look, we have seen and appreciated your leadership, the two of you as a couple in the church. We recognize that the two of you have so much to offer. And so that was the way it was from the very, very start. But there was still that, well, women didn't preach and some of those other pieces that over time have sort of morphed. And and, and all denominations have struggled with some of those kinds of things. Um, you, know, then, you know, then because money was tight at the church, that's how I ended up back in teaching. And, and uh, I'm more than delighted that Cindy you know, is the pastor, and I never felt like, gee, I never got the title pastor, whatever that may be. It's just part of that transition, and churches go through that, um, that sort of process, and there's the whole theology of it, and then there's the practice of it, and what do we do, and so uh, Bendel has always, that's the unique thing. Daniel Band became an extension of Bendel, and let's be honest, not many churches over the years have wanted a Christian rock band as an extension of who they are as a church and maybe not even would be willing to hold on to that as that's something even God even wants. And so, so the uniqueness, even though a church that has, you know, those brethren roots, uh, not as strict as Dan's background, mind you, as, as Dan would say, but, but there was always this progressive sense. And I think this, the dramatic thing is always a deep sense of what does God want? Mm -hmm. and, and so, I look back at, at those group of men. I look back at as really the couples, husbands and the wives over all those years and these incredible people, the generation beyond us, our parents' age, who were phenomenal, incredible, sincere, godly people who were always open to what does God want and trying to kind of manage some of that in the framework of all the history of theology of the New Testament and men and women and all those other kinds of things. So an amazing group of people. And so, you know, Daniel Ben might say if it wasn't for One Way In, and we would simply say if it wasn't for the leadership of the church and Bendel as a church, One Way In would never have happened or whatever that may be. And so this openness to God and what does God want is, is a profound thing, as we all know. And community minded and, uh, you know, our, our vision statement or our mission statement is making disciples who make disciples. And, and so we really want to you know, just get back to what Jesus has called us to do. 
Uh, if you're not doing that, you know, then then close the doors, right? So making uh, disciples, uh, sharing the gospel, and uh, Toronto is so multicultural that, uh, you know, God's brought the nations to our doorstep. So how blessed are we? And so we really want to make an impact on our community. We've always done that with youth. We want to do that uh, more so in, in, a, in a bigger way with adults in our community, and we're taking steps to do that as well. But uh, we don't want to exist just because we want to meet on a Sunday. We want to open those doors and and build relationships into the community. Oh, and there's one other thing. Uh, forgive us for talking that that needs to be said. Uh, Bill Finley came to Christ through One Way In. Mm -hmm. It was in, I get emotional, so just give me a moment. Mm -hmm. Bill came to Christ November 17th. I'm not sure that's the right date. It's November of 1972, he came to One Way In with some of his buddies. He came to faith through One Way In. Matt Del Duca, who became the second drummer of the Daniel Band, I have that right, right, guys? Second yeah. drummer. He came to faith through One Way In because he and his brother, Gino, came with a friend. And so he came to Christ through one way in. And so so that sense of, you know, and particularly for me, Bill, nothing against Matt, of course, but um, certainly that, that's significant, really, really significant that they were the, in a sense, the first fruits of the ministry of one way in. And then God uses those guy, two guys during their time in the in Daniel Band to reach out to literally thousands and thousands more people. And and, and, and I, should, I should add to that now you mentioned Bill Finley. You know, where it started with him as well is that um, when I started going to Bendale, and this would have been around 1977, I think, probably around there, um, it was Dean and Cindy and Bill Finley that sat down with me and sort of gave me an interview about the band that I had about coming to Coffee House. So that's where I met Bill Finley for the first time. I remember it was like a, I think it might have been a Sunday evening even. Maybe we hung around afterwards and we all just sat and chatted the four of us and uh and then uh, bill finley and the coffee house committee came out uh to see our band rehearse to see whether we would be able to play or not and that's when they said yeah okay why don't you guys open up for harvest so that's where i met bill finley for the first time he was on that committee <laughs> Well, I'd just like to mention, um, if I may, in 1984, when Run From the Darkness came out, that was my first encounter with Daniel Band. My cousins introduced me to Daniel Band. And, uh, you know, I, I was 13 at the time. I'm 51 now. And I had a, a Miss Cindy, I, I grew up Baptist. Um, I'm not Baptist now. I'm non-denominational. But I grew up Baptist, and rock music was very taboo, Christian rock for our church and all that jazz, you probably know. Mm -hmm. um, but my youth minister gave me a lot of latitude, and he and I were actually friends. He was like a, a decade my senior. But I remember him taking me to uh, Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith, and that was about as rocking as he got. But that was cool. You know, I could, I could handle that. I, I could stomach it, you know. <laughs> But we had, you know, we had a discussion and he was always kind of leery because my music was was Daniel Band and, and Rez and Striper and Petra. And mm -hmm. oh, yeah. He was always kind of, you know, leery of some of the bands. And, and I said, well, I said, well, well, Brother Troy, I said, man, I, and I was holding up a Daniel Band tape. And I said, I know these guys are Christian beyond a shadow of a doubt. And he said, well, how do you know? And I said, because the word is in their music. Mm -hmm. They are speaking the word. And, and he didn't give me any guff. That he just wanted to know how I knew. And because the Holy Spirit, I mean, the, the word of God was in the music, in the tunes. And I just want to say that you all are looking, and I can honestly say this, you all are looking at a young man who was ministered to while growing up through, well, by the Lord, of course, all glory to him. But the music of Daniel Band, the message really spoke to me. And it 
it leads back from Daniel Band to the fellowship at Bendale and One Way In and how, you know, Mr. Dan and Mr. Tony, how you guys met and how the Lord just orchestrated everything. And I am somebody who was legitimately ministered to by, I mean, I, I held on to every word that you guys sang about me as I read my Bible. And it, and it helped to feed me because it was scripture. That's what feeds you is the scripture, the word of God, as we all know. And I just also want to say, Mr. Tony, I have, you know, uh, your 1990 album here, um, Love in the City. And you have a song, One Way In. And that's yeah. what was special was in... I found like it, it's a ticket stub or something, and you'll see it when the edited version comes out. And it's and it shows one way in, and the address is Bellamy Road. And Mr. Tony, I mean, I've heard about that since 1990 when Mr. Tony put it in the lyrics, you know. And so that's why I feel that connection because it's like in spirit and in hearing the music, I was there through what Tony was singing about. Mm -hmm. Just special stuff. <laughs> yeah, love that song, Tony. Love mm -hmm. that song, Tony. Yeah. Yeah, you've requested it. Yeah, yeah, you better be playing that at the concert. Special request. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> solo, your solo song. Mr. Dean, Miss Cindy, can you guys recall the very first official Daniel Band concert at One Way In? When was Daniel Band's first concert, and what was that like to you all there at the church? I don't do tests well, so um, <laughs> yes, to, to me, the first time that I recall, but they weren't Daniel Band, was, was a Harvest Band date and Harvest it was during that wind down that Tony talked about. And, and so it was, I guess, what you would call the little harvest, as, as Tony would say. So they weren't really Daniel Band, but I, I'm sorry. Uh, Cindy oh, is the one. Song. That'd Cindy, be a great title for a song. I'm sorry. That's a good title, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, that. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not good at that kind of stuff to say the first time I heard Daniel Band. My brain isn't wired that way. So uh, I, I will hand it to Cindy on that oh, one. Thanks. Can you remember, Miss Cindy, when they were actually <laughs> Daniel Band and the electricity hit? I mean. You know, so many of the things, so many of the nights are just, they're all melded together. You know, we just had Daniel Band so often, or we, we had them at, uh, we would rent uh, high schools to be able to to use a larger venues. And and so I just, I just remember, like, they're they're all together. It's just like, it just seems like hundreds. It was of, yeah. There were four, 40 Friday nights in a row, basically from September to the end of April, that we had bands play, and so not as an excuse, but um, you know, I have memories of different bands. So I, I, the best I can give you is sort of a generic Daniel band. I, I do have lots of images of Daniel band in our church basement. You're packed in so tight, and phenomenal to say the least but you know uh, you know but i can't remember the first time i was gonna say i might be able to help you with that because like, we're talking you. about tony and i were just doing this fill in stuff and we're doing a lot of cover stuff like we're doing randy stonehill and larry yeah. norman just a bunch of cover stuff at, at that time we really hadn't written anything yet together and if, if, if i don't know if get this right or not but we we took some time off yeah we we, we told everybody we're not going to be playing for a while we're just going to go and and rehearse and write music and we're, you'll see us again in three months and, and out came this daniel band format that now we that people now know us as but there was this little hiatus in which we, we were like a, in our cocoon developing right and then we came out in this january yeah we came yeah, out and, and i remember we did songs like he's the creator free from sin, sin and this guy and, and that they, they be, that's what's on the first album yeah. so um that kind of became the the prototype of what was to come from that point on right and there we are yeah it's i remember sitting at, at your house uh i'm not sure where in the house you were but you were showing me he's the creator going what do you think of this and going yeah oh i love that yeah that's amazing yeah. you know and that was and, and then there's another time we were doing uh, straight ahead it was Christmas Day, and we, he said, I got this song idea, and I said, well, why don't you come over, and you came over to my house, and then we finished, we finished that one off, and, yeah. but it, it, that's how that came about. 
I, I remember writing, I'm sorry, and I was embarrassed by that, that they're not going to like this song. Oh, I, I remember bringing it to them, and, 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 I'm, and, I'm, and I'm embarrassed. And then Dan goes, that's a great song. <laughs> really? <laughs> you can't, like, so we're not always our best audience, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's turned out to be a, a fairly prominent Daniel Band song over the years. Which, and and it, but again, I was embarrassed by it. And sometimes I did write clunkers, and they'd say, "Well, Tony, the big saying we had was, don't be ashamed, right?'" Mm -hmm. so, so as soon as I heard that, "Don't be ashamed," or, "Don't be embarrassed," it's okay. They were just joking around, but it was it was a way of saying maybe we could think of something a little better. You no, know, when we did like we did, um, um, what was it? What was it? Um, "Free from Sin," right? Right. And I remember when, like, when we were first starting off, I mean, we we had some pretty sparse audiences, right? And I remember yeah. one time we played at your school. Was it two priests and a nun were there? Yes. And that yeah. was it. And then we played an outdoor <laughs> concert in London, Ontario, and there was only pigeons there. Right. You know, and, and, and I remember and, changing the words to all you pigeons, you're gathered here. You know, <laughs> and there was all you chairs, you're gathered here. I remember that one. So, yeah, it wasn't like you know, always there. Uh, uh, oh, goodness. Well, what a classic album. Um, we're going to start transitioning in, into this album, but. In 1982, when you guys came out in full force with this album uh, that had the wonderful I'm sorry on it, Mr. Tony, uh, don't be sorry for I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but in the thanks, Dean and Cindy for the Rice Krispies and chocolate chip cookies. That's what it says on the back of this. Yeah, we know. Yeah. <laughs> so Mr. Dean and Miss Cindy, my question is, was this a then young, young and hungry band's food of choice? Tell us about the Rice Krispies and chocolate chip cookies. I guess I must have done uh, just, you know, like marshmallow treats. That must have been. But the chocolate chip cookies, we still make those. Um, or, or you know, if I have to, if I'm in a hurry, it's chocolate chip squares. So today for a funeral, it was chocolate chip squares because I was in a hurry this week. But yeah, it's like basically the same recipe. They very kindly invited us to come to the studio. Okay. And uh, so it's when, if I recall correctly, but, but you know, uh, they invite us to come to the studio and in typical Cindy style, really, it was in typical Cindy style, was, hey, you know, let's bake some some stuff and, and take them along. And so I think that was the expression uh, that was their way of, I guess, thanking us for the Rice Krispie Squares and cookies at the studio. There might be a little yeah. more than that, perhaps. Yeah perhaps you know well i hope at the 40th and 50th maybe on stage <laughs> you guys can come up with some rice krispies and stuff and yeah. you know Before we dive into that album, um, I just had one more question. Um, you guys mentioned about, you know, having all these bands play and and earlier I know you mentioned that you had res band come up at times. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering, were there other bands that you had play up there that we would know besides res band? Out of the States, I can't, I can't think of anybody else no there was a unique uh, and dan and tony you guys should, really should comment to this I'm trying to think of the unique they were, they had that you had with res band when you played at chapuza or down there and in light of that unique thing you can explain that we with you as a band said hey why don't we bring res band up and do some res dan yeah yeah concerts <laughs> as they were referred to and we did i think three or four of those if i'm not yeah. mistaken convocation hall yes and Massey Hall? Not Massey Hall, but you guys could comment that connection with, they were the only band that we, I guess, would say that other people knew. Any Anyone who played at One Way In, they were all local uh, Southern Ontario. There was one band, I'm, and, and I'm trying to think of their name, and they had an album, I think it was called Things Break. I'm trying to think of their name, but if they toured with Michael W. Smith, I don't know if you knew that or not. They were okay, very much like the police. Do you guys, anybody remember the name? They so did very was, well. That and, was later. Uh, was that was that the band that had the, that had the dad playing in the band in, in the three or four? No, they did well too. That's yeah. another band. They, okay. they did very well. Was and the they, dad? They were a three-piece band, and they had very uh, police-like sound, like the police. And uh, they did apparently they they recorded. I think. Okay. Uh, 
uh, Randy Stonehill or somebody like that came up to, and they recorded in Montreal and he produced it. They did really okay. well. Okay. So, and I think one of them had the bass player or somebody passed away. So maybe that's what brought about the end of the band. But no, the, we weren't the only band that got to the States. There was, there was a couple of bands that got to the States. Okay. Now, I know the connection with Res Band is that we did this demo, uh, I think about five songs that were on it. Um, and it, it fell into Glenn Kaiser's hands somehow. Um, we didn't send it to him. I don't even know how he got it. Um, and he he said that he really had this 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 um, feeling for Canada, like a calling for Canada that was on his heart. And when he heard that we were Canadians, he said, "I really believe that these guys are the guys who are going to be a voice for Canada." Mm. And and so uh, that's how the relationship kind of got started. And then we would Res Band would, would come up. Yeah, and DNC, you know, the coffee house would bring them in and we would open up for them. And so we just became very good friends over the years. And so it kind of picked up this thing, the Res Dan concerts, you know, the Res Dan gets the flakes out, you know, it's a Res Dan. <laughs> when we recorded the first album, Glenn Kaiser and Roger Heist came up and helped produce that album. Yeah, they were in right. the studio with us. Yeah, that's right. I remember. Doing they were just gracious enough to come up and yeah. say, you know, we'll help you with that. We really want to help yeah. you guys, you know. And I remember well, the encouraging words of uh, Glenn Kaiser to me. He says, Tony, with that mustache and those pointy shoes, you're going somewhere. So, <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Can, you, can, you, uh, can you show me that album, the back of it, for a second? Because I think, yeah, I think in, in that picture with, of me there, the I'm top. wearing a Res Band shirt. Yeah, bring it down a bit. There we are. Res yeah, Band shirt. Yeah. And what's interesting, see that bass there? That bass is used to belong to Jim Denton. It was in Resurrection wow. Band, wow. and that was the bass that he recorded the album Colors with. Oh, and I love awesome. that bass. And he said, "Do you want it?" I said, "I'd love to have it." So when he got a new bass, he said, "Hey, you can have my bass." That is amazing. Yeah. I did not know that. So it's got some history to it. That that bass too. You know? Yeah, I didn't know that. Wow. And all this time, I thought y'all were wearing Daniel Band shirts. <laughs> no, you and Bill. Well, I have mine on today. Yeah, that's not sure. Very nice. <laughs> sure. I was going to say it again. Very nice. That's a good looking shirt, Mr. Dane. Um, oh, shoot. I was going to ask. Oh, I lost my train of thought. Well, oh, Salome and Cross Section. Those are two Canadian rock and metal bands. Did, did any of those bands ring a bell to you guys? I think the first one, so I may have met yeah, the guy from Solom. Brian know. Lutz was I mean, the drummer. I, I, think he was from, I think he was from Ottawa. Were they from Ottawa? I think I met him. Very talented mm -hmm. group. And so, uh, yeah, a, Toronto has a lot of great musicians, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of famous great musicians, at least in the secular world. But even in the Christian realm, there were a lot of great musicians. Like uh, there, was, there were a lot of things, a lot of material to choose from for Dean and Cindy when they're picking bands around France because a lot of bands were playing in those days, a lot, a lot of uh, very accomplished. Uh, yeah, Outrider, Oops. you know, Tim Huff and Outrider. Yeah. yeah. Loved, uh, loved them. Shepherd's Flock. We had a lot of Squad bands music. who just expressed gratitude that One Win was there and it was a place that they could play. And, um, you know, we met. Some... And they had, they had a band that was heavier than us. They had a band called Covenant. They were really. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really, oh, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah. 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 You know, I remember them with Tim Clayton on vocal. Yes. And their drummer is now our drummer. The, the drummer for Covenant is now Daniel Man's drummer, Frank Catcher and Bowen. You'll see him. Yes. He played, with us. Yeah. Yeah. he played with us in Ohio. That was the drummer you saw in Ohio. He was playing in Covenant. Day for a while. And, and, our and then he played in a not so heavy band called Danny for a long time. They were a good band. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and Mr. Tony, am I mistaken? But didn't Frank also play on your two? I have your other, um, your, your TRB yeah. album. He played on those albums. Yeah, he played on my solo albums. That's right. Yeah, he's he's one of my all time favorite drummers. When when I, I when I used to go see Amy, they were a great band, but I couldn't I couldn't get myself to Frank Catcher when he's playing. I thought he was that's such a good drummer. And I remember um, I tried to kind of always coax him and coming get him to come to play with me. And I used to bring him flowers, chocolates, and stuff. <laughs> he, finally, he finally agreed. You're courting him. So, I quite courted him. And we've been playing we've been playing together for many years now. Yeah, so well, that's wonderful. Great to be able to have that long term relationship with him. Mm. Mr. Dean, you, you talked about many bands expressing their thanks that One Way In was there. Um, the thanks on here, outside of you two, Daniel Band expresses thanks to the elders of Bendale Bible Chapel and the One Way In Coffee House for their continuous support and willingness to move in new directions. And that was the wording in on this 1982 album. And so 
I'm just uh, surmising that this these new directions was this this hard music that was coming out of this wonderful album. Mr. Dean and Miss Cindy, um, and, and you kind of mentioned this, Mr. Dean, you know, you're talking about the elders at the time and kind of gathering to pray and to think on this and everything. For you two in particular, um, this is certainly a classic rock album. It came out in 82, so it's in that fold. But I was just thinking about this, you know, this is very much on par with Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple type stuff that came out in the very late 60s and early 70s. Mr. Dean, Miss Cindy, with you two, was that part of your musical diet at the time, that type of music, or was it a different type of music that you all were used to, such as Miss Cindy, the Baptist hymns? Was that kind of your thing, or did you all go up on a diet of that hard rock back in the day? I don't think I was really uh, on, you know, as a teenager, I don't think I was that much into the the hard rock bands. Um, certainly loved, you know, the Christian rock as it was as it was developing. Um, I don't think you listened to much secular. I, I didn't listen to much music at all. I mean, if I listened to, you know, had a you know few Gordon Lightfoot albums or whatever that may be, I I didn't really listen. To, I wasn't a music guy. I was a sports guy, not but just playing sports, but a lot. But I did some, but watching sports, and so that was my deal. So I wasn't. I'm not a. To be honest, I'm not a music guy per se. I'm a lyric guy, and so often. It, Often at coffee house at one way and people would come to me and say, so you don't like the band because I was musing on the words all the time. Uh, that was sort of my headspace. So to me, you know, I, I absolutely love rock music, but, you know, had no clue about secular rock or anything of any sure. kind. Didn't listen to anything. Um, I had an Aqualung album. I'm not sure exactly how that ended up in with a couple of other things I had. I'm not sure, but. No, I, all that stuff you've described, I didn't listen to anything like that. I never even listened to a radio. So, well, let's talk I think, about. I think, I think you were listening to Evie, weren't you? <laughs> uh, no, no. Hey, Dan, she's, she's not Evie. She's my sister. <laughs> you know, you know. On that point, seriously, my mom listened to Evie. Um, it was uh, probably 1977 that I. Uh, my mom shared the gospel with me, and I gave my heart to the Lord. And so I started listening to some of the music she was listening to, and Evie was one of those things. Yeah. And and I, in my early development, I mean, some of that music ministered to me. So. Yeah, yeah, sure. Amy Grant, yeah, oh, Keith Green, but you know, Petra. I was always listening yeah. to Petra. As every anything that came out from Petra, I was yeah. I was busy listening. That's right. Petra was the first band that introduced me, and then Daniel Band was the second that I ever heard that was Christian rock, and Daniel Band just cranked it to 11. And me coming from the Kiss Camp at the time, in the late 70s, uh, Petra was an answer to prayer, and then Daniel Band just bowled me over, and I was, you know, you know I was in heaven on earth. But, but let's talk about <clears throat> Mr. Dean, Miss Cindy, with you all being ministers, uh, let's talk about the fruit from Daniel Band concerts. Can you all talk about what you have seen and, and evidenced and witnessed about the fruit coming from Daniel Band concerts? What sticks out to you regarding that? I think that, you know, as, as people would, would hear the message and, and we, we, uh, most nights we had a testimony, we encouraged bands to, to speak in between their songs. There was always an opportunity at the end, um, you know, a, a type of invitation, you know, you want to talk about, uh, talk more with the band or some of the, the leaders here, uh, we're, we're here to, to spend time 
talking to you about Jesus and praying with people and and seeing lives change and and you know because people were coming from uh, many different um, areas within uh, Toronto, uh, you know some would go back to and and find churches where they they lived or some would settle in Bendale. Um, but you know we saw people and and, and sometimes it like we just don't even know the the, the fruit until we pop. Uh, you know, we we run into somebody and and we hear or Dean heard from a student like that. You know, this was this was life changing, bringing him to a Daniel Band concert. And and so like sometimes we have no idea, and then somebody will come with this story, and and I think God just pulls back the curtain and says, you know. Maybe you're feeling discouraged about something now. I want you to know what was happening back then, and and let you see um, the, the fruit that is that is still coming from this. Because we're kind of amazed, right? That that you know, even now when people are talking about that, and oh, people were blessed at one way in, or people were blessed through the Daniel Band concert, and they grew and they they got to know the word, as you were saying, um, that you know, you you hung on their lyrics, but really tied into God's word. So you're a blessing today. Like we never, we never would have known. Um, and when, so when we, uh, when we played in Ohio last week, we have, I have people come up to me from Alabama, North Dakota, West Virginia, uh, Oklahoma. And they were telling us how um, uh, we, we were their friends. Like one, one, one gentleman said to me, you don't know this, but you've been my friend for years. And I go, and, and I like, like it, it it's very emotional we just talk about it but we have no idea what's happening out there yeah. in the world and we have dan has a friend who came over from south africa who's bought our material in south africa so people all over the world have been listening to us and ha have been uh influenced to, to walk closer with christ and, and uh, that, that that can be there can be any better news that we could hear you know mm -hmm. it, it's great to hear all you guys have tight or you guys uh i like your style but the, the, the most common thing we hear is your lyrics have really spoken to me over the years and uh, and we're, we're, we're just we're just blessed in that well and we've it was, said this. it was birth it was birthed in the basement of bendale bible chapel yeah. mm -hmm. you know. well we birthed in prayer from you know yeah. people who started a lot like, of prayer you, that's, we were, I, 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 a lot there was a lot of prayer in those days it was we wouldn't just get together and have rehearsals but always pray pray for it for, yeah. for everything and you, we always pray for it you know, well we've said we've said this to a lot of bands you know with like me and Kent and Mike growing up um, and to a lot of uh, churches kind of weren't maybe on board with that style of music. You guys were kind of like our youth ministers, so to speak, growing up all these different bands. And so, it, I, you know, it's hard to tell you guys what you mean to us just from that perspective too, of like, yeah, you did have Christian lyrics. You, you know, a lot of bands even put Bible verses in there. I know Petra did that a lot, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you guys understand or can appreciate w what you mean to us growing up and how much of a foundation that built in us, you know, over our life with that starting out like that. I think what's really interesting, I think, when you look at this, I with that question, I think about Daniel Band concerts. And I think about One Way In and other places like that. I think, I think those contexts are different, but I think it has to do with how intentional the band is. Daniel Band was intentional about lyrics. They were intentional about how they lived. Mm -hmm. The guys in their own personal lives and in their, their family lives, they were very, very intentional. Um, and depending on the concert, how intentional was the promoter? to make sure there was Christian literature available, how much were they prepared, as we always did with Daniel Band concerts. Um, we always had counselors available afterwards and a place people could go and material we could hand out and, you know, sort of like that Billy Graham model, I suppose, you know, and filling out the paperwork or whatever. Con concerts are a, a different context, but there's the intentionality but then when you take one way in and all those places that function in that there's still the same intentional piece but what i think in that you have a dynamic that people get absorbed into the one way in family or in in sort of that dynamic and and so i think both of those 
certainly go a long way. And each of you guys and other people, you had the Daniel Band experience and all those things, but at the same time, you were rooted in some church family or youth group or something like that. So all that stuff sort of, you know, blended together. And and we always felt strongly, and, and I know Daniel Band did, and as we worked with bands, look, we're intentional about this. You know, when, you know, when, you know, I think it was Dan talked about meeting going meeting with them as a band mana and talking to them we always tried to meet with bands and talk to them to find out how intentional were they and what who were they and what does that mean and you know we had some bands who played at one way in and you'd swear that they they never seemed to talk about anything they played their songs not to be unkind and we just encouraged them you know please feel free uh you know to talk and intentional and, and those kinds of things and i think it's that intentional whatever the ministry might be the intentional about what you do and who the people are and that was a uniqueness i think uh of our relationship in particular obviously with daniel band us as a church in one way in mm -hmm. but certainly when daniel band played wherever they played um incredible people who did incredible things to invite bands and put the whole thing together um well, mr dean that's a perfect segue right now um friends October the 22nd, so roughly two weeks, two Saturdays from the time of this airing on October the 8th, there will be a live streamed event. I believe it's at One Way In, and mm -hmm. it's celebrating the 50th anniversary of One Way In, the golden anniversary, and it's also celebrating the 40th anniversary of On Rock with Daniel Band, and of course all glory is going to the Lord, we know that, um, mm -hmm. for both of these occasions, but Mr. Dean, Miss Cindy, Mr. Tony, Mr. Dan. Um, where can one view this live stream event and who can view it? Just tell us all about it, please. Okay, we have to have the uh, live stream link. One one of uh, our elders, Dave Robinson, will uh, either he's providing it or, or Jeff Bag. I'm not sure which one is. I think it's Dave is going to provide the the live stream link. Uh, so I'm going to have to to get that to you, um, and uh, so we'll be able to to do that. Uh, we're we're thinking about. Uh, how we're going to to manage the, the number of people who are wanting to come because we you know we're not we're not a large church like we're a small church in Scarborough and uh, we figure we can fit maybe 135 maybe 150 in the basement yeah but if you go and, back to uh, the old days we can get 612 in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um and uh and then there's you know if, if people if there's an overflow they can be upstairs watching it on on screens upstairs uh the question is we did that before yeah yes. yeah and and the question is like do we do do we end up doing two concerts? So we'll, we'll... This is what I need to talk to you about today. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll get the, the live stream information to you. What time is that going to be um, that day? Do you guys have the time set yet or not? Well, if we, since we don't know if we're doing two concerts, it's not set. So, so at the moment, seven o'clock. Yes, at the moment, seven o'clock. Is that Easter? So the, time? the other thing we were talking about, which, which I was going to talk to Tony about today, was um, are you thinking maybe um, like five or six and eight or something like that? Or yeah, something? do a five, five o'clock. Yeah, do a five o'clock and do an eight o'clock. The, uh, the thought was to do that um, so that we can get as many people into the church basement. I mean, I would say in the church basement, no, we could, I think we could get 175. Depends on how many are standing, how many are sitting, or whatever. I think we probably could. Uh, well, I, I counted chairs today. We only have 80, well, so don't, maybe don't more. Will be. It, it wouldn't be like a Friday and a Saturday. It's just going to be all, all at once, two concerts, one after the other. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so. Yes. Okay. It's yeah. kind of like when wow. the Lord, you know, well, broke the law. Yes. That, that, that was a yes, Tony? Well, I'm asking, I'm asking them, is that what you want? You, you heard one, it here. One, first. Out, one after <laughs> the other. Okay. 
So two, okay, fine. Back to back. Back to back, okay. And, and I'm thinking we should probably do the live stream for the second one, not the first. Sure. Just, okay. We, we, yeah. we used to do that when we played at a prison in, in uh, Millbrook. That was we, fun. Okay. We had to do two concerts because the first group would kill the second group. You put them together, so we had to, we had to split them up them. and do separate concerts. Well, so we, we, just, we were, we're used to doing that. Well, there's no that way was a to great time. Yeah. We played this prism on a second. No, we played this this prison. Yeah. And Tony was introducing I'm sorry. And he was talking about I'm sorry. And one guy yells out, Yeah, well, we're all sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I just thought if you did one concert, we don't have we have no idea of knowing how many people will come, obviously. Um, <laughs> but we just thought if you did did one and you got 150 plus people in the basement, and then you know, you could get you know, 150 upstairs, maybe the 150 upstairs won't be happy being upstairs. Um, you know, but, so no for, way to forgive me, forgive me for making a suggestion live in front of everybody. In front of everybody. You might consider Friday night, Saturday night, because Friday night was the one win night. Friday night, so have them. I'm good with that too. Whatever have you on guys Friday night, leave everything set up, come back to another one Saturday night. And, you might consider, and we used to do that at one, um, the Extreme Mission. We used to do Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Saturday. That's so, the mission. Every time we play the three. So here are you guys. We're, we're right now. So just something in, to think about. Yeah. This, yes. this podcast that you're seeing on air right now, <laughs> you're actually seeing us plan this thing live here. So that's right. It's a well thought out plan. So yeah. Yeah. Well, it, one seemed to be okay until we kept hearing that people were flying in for oh. for the concert, and then we were like, hmm. Okay. I bet you're going to have a lot of people. I I. Well, that's what I think. I agree. Yeah. Friends, what we will do um, in Miss Cindy, uh, either Miss Cindy directly or through Mr. Dan or however, they will get the, the links to me on when this will be, when you can view and the link to go to. And, and this, it will be put in the description. Um, am I saying that Rex? right? Yes, Rex? that's right. It'll be in the description of the video. What he said, what Rex said. So look in the description and you'll see the link. Um on Rock, such a great album. Mr. Dan, Mr. Tony, you guys influenced me, and I went on to be in a, a little little rock band in my local area, a Christian rock band. And I remember us recording in the studio and then getting everything back when the finished product, you get it back, and, and you know, we would sit down as a band and listen to the finished product. And I'm only bringing that up to say uh, number one, I mean, you guys impacted my life. The Lord used you to impact my life. The other thing is that um, here we are 40 years later. We're talking about an incredible album musically and uh, spiritually through the lyrics, the words. Did you guys know that you had something special? Like, if, did you guys sit down 40 years ago when you had this album and did you listen to it together? Where were you at the first time that you heard the complete product? And then what are your thoughts today, 40 years later, in knowing that so many people, as evidenced in Versailles, Ohio, highly regard Daniel Band and highly regard the album On Rock? What are your thoughts in your own words? Well, for, first of all, none of this was expected. I, I, I thought we were going to get together fill in a few concerts and I'd go back to my teaching job and, and once in a while play guitar on my own. I, I never thought we would make an album that people are talking about 40 years later and then we'd have people from all over North America and even the world saying that they're, being, they're, that they're influenced by the lyrics and uh, to me it's just a, a big surprise. It feels like it's happening to somebody else. It's not something I expected I, and uh, I don't know. It, it's hard to take it in. It's, it's hard to absorb it. It's like, is, is this real? I mean, it is real, I know, but uh, it's just God working and I think we'll, we'll know the full impact of this when we get to heaven. We see the yeah. Lord. We see the fruit up there, and then people, you know, who, who have eternal life and, and enjoy God for, forever. And that's the that's the best thing that could happen. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the, the, in a word, to me, this is just a big surprise. I was not expecting it. And it's, I'm still surprised to this day. Mm -hmm. We just we just got together and started to write songs that about stuff that we we felt personally. And just wrote it in a style that we liked. Um, but, you know, in other interviews, I've said, like, we never really had any plans. No. Ever. 
Now, Dean, Dean mentioned being intentional. We were intentional and when we wrote a song, well, we, we, we wanted to glorify God, yeah. but we just never thought it would have the longevity, that it would, that it would have the impact, right? Like we didn't have a five-year plan model here. No, not at all. <laughs> no. So, <clears throat> Mr. Tony, well, we had asked Mr. Dan. We're honored that you're here and showing interest in us. We're honored that you, folks mm -hmm. like you. Christian people like you guys show interest in the band and want to talk about us and talk to us. It's a, it's a great honor and a, again a great surprise and we're, we're just deep, deeply honored. You know. mm -hmm. I used to get agitated. You broke up, Mr. Tony. What were you saying? It's great that you're out there doing what you do. You guys are great. Thank, thanks for getting you know, the have, word out. for having us and getting the word out. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you and. You know, I used to, speaking about getting the word out back in the 80s, I used to get agitated when I would talk to people that listen to Christian rock and metal. And if they didn't hear the Dan, hear of the Daniel band, if they didn't know them, I'd get agitated. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean you never heard of this band? You know, they're the best band ever. So, Mr. Tony, I'd like to ask you really quick, <clears throat> because Mr. Dan has been our guest before. Right. You are such a wonderful guitarist. And Amen. Amen. just a shredder. Thank you. Um, were you self-taught or did you take lessons and who were some of your influences? Uh, all of the bands you mentioned earlier that you asked Dean were, were my influences. I thought, yeah, that's the, those are my bands. Like everybody you mentioned, absolutely. Uh, but I am self-taught. I would just buy albums, put the, the needle down on the vinyl album, lift it up and try to figure it out by ear. And then I noticed right away in high school, I, I, I'd always like to make stuff up. So I, I, I no one taught me, or I, I didn't go take composing lessons. It's just something I just do naturally, and it's just some. And the, and I have self taught. My dad started me on guitar. My dad is a, he was a great Italian folk guitarist. He showed me these great, beautiful Italian folk songs. And it, and in the last couple of years, I've started to learn them because I, I, I thought that's good guitar playing. So I actually can play some of that stuff now. But I abandoned it and just started listening to Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin, and and uh, that that was the music that appealed to me. And so that I, I tried to emulate it. And then I started writing it as well. So, um, but it's, it's basically a self self directed kind of thing. I, I didn't take lessons. No, we used to call them fleet fingers. <laughs> How, having said all that, this this is the era of guitar players. That you can't have an ego because I because of YouTube and the internet. I watch eight year olds doing these incredible things on guitar. I think I can't. I'll never be able to do that in three lifetimes, right? So it's very it's it's, it's if you have an ego and your guitar player. You know, you're out of luck in this area because there's so much, so much great talent out there. That for me, it's just just have fun. Uh, it's, it's you know, it's have fellowship with the bros and, and glorify God. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not, it can't be it can't be an ego thing at this point. You know, there's just so many great musicians out there. But thanks for the compliment, I appreciate it. Well, thank Glory. you for blessing me with so many wonderful songs. Friends, go out right now and drop the needle on lustful illusions on Straight Ahead. Oh my goodness, blowing me blowing me away. Mr. Tony, your your and Mr. Dan's imprint is all over the album on rock and, and the other albums too. And of course, Mr. Bill's in there too. I'm thinking of Undercover Christian with him, that wonderful keyboard part that he did, very haunting. But I'd like to ask you about one song in particular, Mr. Tony. Um, <clears throat> you don't need the blues. Right. A friend of mine pointed out during the guitar solo, you're doing these swells. And I'm like, I've always thought, you know, that sounds very familiar. And one day I had a friend with me and they were singing to it, you know, rejoice, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Right. And that's so neat because, you know, juxtapose against you don't need the blues. Where did you get the idea to put that part in there with the swells? Um, well, it, it's, you, you basically described it right there. The song is you don't need the blues. We don't, instead of having the blues, instead of being down, let's rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. And that was a song I used to sing when I used to go to uh, prayer meetings and, and Wednesday nights. And that was a very popular song at that time. And, and it just, I thought that's very appropriate for this song. And, and uh, the swell, I like the sound of the swells. I like doing it. So uh, perfect spot to put it. It sure was neat. And then Mr. And Dan doesn't mind just going da 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 for half an hour behind the line. I just well, I go out there and have all this fun. I just let him go. Right? 
Let him go. He'll come back eventually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I can ask, how, how long did it take to do the entire album, roughly, guys? Do you know how, how much time you spent in the studio? Probably a few. It wasn't that long. No. Probably a few yeah. weeks. We, we, did, we did a lot of recording downstairs at the M Street Mission in Toronto. And then we mixed it in that couple of weeks. And then we mixed it for in a couple of, in a week. It was about a week. Yeah. Yeah. And then we mixed it at uh, Phase One, is also in Scarborough. Great studio at that time, and uh, that took a, a week or two, and wasn't very. It didn't take very long. How how those pieces were assembled is that there was a guy named Mark Wright, and he was he engineered it, and he worked on a lot of big uh, secular projects. Um, one of them being a group called Triumph, mm -hmm. and we really liked their sound. And Mark Wright was the engineer on that, and so we tried to track down mark right he, he worked at phase one studio and that was like the studio where a lot of rock bands recorded kiss and everybody else would keep record there and so we got in touch with mark right and said would you engineer this for us for the mix and he said yeah for sure that's how we ended up in phase one studio and then that's when glenn and roger came up and and helped mix it down wonderful cool mr dan i'd like to ask you about a particular song that you had pinned uh, the song is I Like to Rock, and I always thought it very interesting and neat, kind of one of those neat little curveballs, kind of like Mr. Tony's Rejoice part in the solo. You say you don't like rock, well, that's okay, because I don't like the opera, and you sing that in that operatic fashion. <laughs> when did the idea, whose idea was that, and when did it hit you, I can do this this way for these lyrics? I wish I had an answer for that. I have no idea. Um, I, can, I, I think the whole theme of the song was that I wasn't going to apologize for playing the style of music, right? And you might not like it. Well, there's stuff I don't like, but it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's like, and, and, and it, was, it was cool to go to the three, four time. You know, it's like, um, ba, 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 it was a little ba. different, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's kind of interesting just to get off the road. I don't even know how that, how we keep, I, yeah, how that came about. Some things just happen by themselves, I guess. I don't, I don't know. It's, it, yeah, it, it's a long time ago, I guess. I don't know. Well, and then one other song I'd like to specifically address, and um, this was very neat because, Mr. Tony, you played the mandolin on this, and Mr. Yep. Dan, I believe you actually pinned this one. The song is Spiritual Game. Mm -hmm. um, and just thinking about the lyrics, and they've always been applicable. All the lyrics to all of these songs are always applicable because they're rooted in God's word and God's word is timeless. Um, but let me just quote, and the preacher preaches on with the humanistic message made to soothe your soul while the truth about your sin goes untold. Boy, I just think about the times that we're living in today if it feels good, do it. Just do it. You be you. Um, I just want to say, Mr. Dan, Mr. Tony, Mr. Dean, Miss Cindy, thank you all for preaching the truth, for presenting the truth in love. Mm -hmm. um, the truth was, has never been flinched from with the ministry that you all have, and it's presented in a, in a fashion and rooted in love. Second Corinthians 13, 6. I mean, I was just thinking about this through this song. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And then in John 8, 32, Jesus, Yeshua, he said, the truth will set you free. And I, I personally, as a Christ follower, feel like that's why people aren't free today and they're still searching for stuff and it's empty because it's all humanistic messages and nobody's being set free. Mm -hmm. And I just had to bring this to light because that song, Spiritual Game, it was more of a deeper cut uh, from that album, but such a deep, hard-hitting message and a truthful message. Um, 
I just needed to make mention of that because I that's where my mind went today and in, in going over this material. Um, any thoughts, Mr. Dan? Yeah, if I can comment on that, I when you read it back to me, I go, wow, that's that's pretty deep stuff. Um, and Tony and I have had this conversation many times as we, as I, you know, I, was, I remember one time I was sitting in Florida, I was listening to some of our albums, just kind of reminiscing, listening, I'm going, and I talked talk to Tony, I said, I don't know where we came up with this stuff. I, and I looked at the lyrical content and some of the things and in, in, in the one you just read there, and I'm going, um, that, that's, a lot of that stuff is inspired, I have to say, because I'm not that clever. I'm not that smart to come up with that. And when I hear that back, I go, oh, that's, that's not me. I, I, that's not my genius. So God just put these things there and they came out. We, we did a concert one night, one way night. I don't know if Dean and Cindy will remember. It was, we, we did everything. We decided to do five or six songs on acoustic, just with a finger yes, sound, yeah. just a remember that? folky style. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember doing those songs and, and listening to Dan sing. I was playing guitar and it's just the two of us between mm -hmm. these, these uh, handful of songs. And I think, wow, those are those lyrics. Because all of a sudden, instead of hearing you know, all the thrash and all, the, <laughs> all, the, all that, you know, the drums and everything, we're, I, I'm hearing the lyrics. I think, wow, listen to those lyrics. They, they were, they're like, they're songs that we wrote, but they were impacting me because because they were standing, I guess, alone, or they were they were standing out more. They weren't distracted. It was, there wasn't music distracting, and uh, I think God just put that in our hearts. I, you know, I know, you know, you hear they'll tell the Lord did, did it, or the Lord gave it to me, but I think it's actually true. We were inspired. I mean, with the Holy Spirit indwells us and, and guides us and, and leads us into all truth as you were talking about truth and and we we love the truth we crave the truth we want to talk tell the truth and talk about it and sing about it mm -hmm. and that's what and it, i think you, you phrased it well you know that this is what we're about it's just getting to the truth and, and not shying away from it right and as and i think i think there's a lot of things in this era where truth is being trumped political correctness or or you know a lot of censorship going up uh, i know people don't realize Canada has a lot of censorship. There's some things you just can't say anymore. Uh, the truth is in getting out, and I think that's why we're losing our freedoms. We, we need the truth to get out to be free people. The truth will make you free. Yes. It's, it's getting to be that way down here, too, trust me. That's <clears throat> well, this realm is not our home, and we know, we know what's to come, and we know the final outcome, and we can all uh, hallelujah, you know, praise the Lord, because you know, I'm going home one day, and we're, there's going to be a party in heaven out here, right, guys? Yeah. Party in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, let's talk about another party really quick. Uh, celebrating this 40 years, my buddy Rex got to go to a party in Versailles, Ohio, roughly seven days ago at the time of this airing, September the 10th. Mr. Dan, Mr. Tony, Rex, my buddy, tell us about Versailles, Ohio. Tell us what went down and, and the good time had. Well, first of all, I wasn't even sure I was gonna make it across the border. Uh, I don't know if I should be admitting this online, but I, I'm not into this whole vaccination thing. So uh, that was the first big obstacle to get across. And then, and then I, of course, my, my son said, you, you think you're going to have trouble getting across or you're going to have more trouble getting back because now you have to have this other thing called arrive can, which I also do not participate. But the Lord got us through it all. Yeah. And um, when we uh, when we were there, we had to we do we didn't have to. I won't say we had to, but we had meet and greet now. Talking tires me. I used to be a teacher. Talking all day tires me out. So I had to talk for an hour with people that I didn't know very well, but it was great to hear them, but you, you want to be there for them. So I was talking for a full hour before I went on stage. I got on stage after all, all that we went through, and I'm thinking, I'm worn out. I'm tired. <laughs> you did I, but I have to do a gig now. <laughs> well, you, you couldn't tell that, though, Tony, by your know, guitar playing. I had, a script, I had a scripture going through my mind about you. You who exalt the Lord, this, this is in the Apocrypha, by the way, not, it's not in the regular thing. You who exalt the Lord, do so robustly and with all your voice and, and with your, at the top of your voice and don't be weary. And it was going through my mind. 
I thought, that's right. I am not going to be weary. So I started jumping around and hopping around and I, I woke up, right? So I, I, I actually did the gig, but I remember that feeling when I first thought, oh man, I, I, I gotta get past it. But I did get past it, praise God, you know? Right? You agree? Yes? So I remember you, uh, I Yes, I mean, um, you know, and you're talking about the meet and greet. Um, I, I know, I can imagine, you know, you're like talking with, yeah, complete strangers and I can see how that would be a, just a little bit tiresome and just kind of weird too. I, I can sort of but, see you know, your point of view of that. But what was good about it is as we're playing, I'm looking out in the audience and now I know all these people and I'm exactly. looking at all oh, I know you. Oh, I know you. And, and, I, and they've told me about themselves. So I know things about them. So now it was, it was like playing in front of like friends and people I know. So it actually ended up being a good thing. Right. So I just yes. Get past that little, what what was the when was the last time you guys played together before that concert? I'm just curious, roughly. I think a few 2017. years. 2017. Yeah, about 2017. Yeah, we did a small little church in just east of Toronto area. We did a little well, tour, right? We did two or three. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and we did uh, one in Belleville at my in-laws. I've been married for 36 years, and my in-laws were the first time they ever saw me play in the band. They they live in Belleville, so it's the first time they ever saw us play after. It, all these years of marriage. Right? And, it just, and you know what? Like Tony's in-laws were in the audience. So he was a little nervous oh, about oh. how they might receive this, right? So he came over and says, do you really need to do that scream in Bethel? Or do you think we can leave it out tonight? <laughs> well, we, we, put, we, we put it in. And they, 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 they did it they, anyway. They, they, like, they liked it all. It was good. It was and that, that was the great opener to the concert. I mean... The whole concert was incredible, guys. Everyone that I talked to was like, they were loving it. It was it was really a dream come true for me, too, because, you know, I've never seen you guys in concert, you know, with being you guys being in Canada, Nat, and and, and to meet you guys, to meet your wife, uh, Dan, too, and Michelle. You guys came right up to me, you know, before the concert, and it, it was just so awesome to fellowship with you guys and talk, and um, yeah, just, I will never forget the whole weekend and with you guys getting to meet you guys it was wonderful well i have to say that it was it was we probably had more fun than anybody sure but you know i i want to say as well and um you know it was steve with bmi mm -hmm. yes put that on and i want to tell you it was a first class event oh yes um, you know the sound system the equipment the back backline equipment the staging you know, we were just treated so well and so welcome. Um, I'll tell you, it was it was a highlight for us. It was so well done. So I said I sent Steve an email later. I said, you know, um, you know, make sure you thank your team because they just did an outstanding job. It was also great great to meet the other bands. Yeah, like, I, I enjoyed talking to um, uh, uh, from Petra, uh, Greg Greg Volts. And, Greg Volt, you know, yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a big yeah. fan, so it's yeah. great to talk to some of my heroes too. Is you know, I mean, it was almost like uh, we were talking about just me and some of the fans. The whole thing is kind of like a family reunion. Like yeah. it, sure. it really was a great atmosphere and just wonderful. The whole thing was just yeah, you couldn't ask for anything better in my opinion. No, it, was, it was a little taste of heaven there. It was, it was a really wonderful. Nice. Oh, most it was definitely, awesome. yes, great. yes, a lot of fun. So, guys, I got tickled because. It's like Tony and Dan were like two young kids, and Tony's like, "Hey, Dan, can you keep it down? Because I'm about to get in trouble here." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about right, <laughs> getting in trouble by the parents, you know. <laughs> Well, a after the concert dance, is, is everything okay with your in-laws? Is it, yeah, you're all right? <laughs> yeah, no, we're okay, we're okay. Yeah. So I'm looking at the time and we'll kind of, we'll kind of start tapering down here, but I I'd like to make mention really quick, um, Mr. Tony, uh, when, when Mr. Dan was visiting with us on a, on a prior episode, he mentioned the song Black or White from Running Out of Time. And he said that song initially was kind of up for grabs on who might sing the lead vocals. He said kind of between you and him and Dan said, I put a little extra turbo in my vocals that time because I really was wanting to, to ha have that song, you know. 
we were discussing the possibility. And I mean, I hope Mr. Tony, Mr. Dan, I hope you guys know how loved you guys are and respected. And I know, you know, Mr. Dan, as we talk, you guys have about five or so sporadic songs that were included as, as, as extras on some of your remasters in latter, more recent years. Mm. We were discussing the possibility of perhaps taking those songs and maybe if you guys could have five extra new ones to put in there. And I was, you know me, Mr. Dan, I got to dig a little bit. I think it'd be so awesome if we did, if there was a version of Black or White with Tony taking the lead, just for posterity's sake, us knowing the story. It'd be great to have a new Daniel Band album, as you mentioned, uh, Frank Contrabone on the drums. What are the, what are the odds? What are the possibilities? Because you guys are still so much loved. Well, first of all, <clears throat> I'm one of the lucky guitar players in the world who gets to play guitar with one of the best singers in the world. So, <laughs> so uh, to me, that's uh, it's always been a, a, a treat to know that I'm going to write. If I write something, it's going to sound good because I got Dan McKay no, singing it. So, right. I so I, I don't know. if I mean, I, I could try singing it, but uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to have I, I'm, I was happy to have Dan sing that. It was good. I I. I I think it's good that I sing a little bit, gives Dan a, a okay. rest, but, sure. but I, I'm just a lonely guitarist. And I, but I, you I, know I, what I mentioned in that interview? I should I should clarify. What I mentioned in the interview is there, there are certain styles um, that Tony really does great with that I wouldn't, um, and there's songs that I do that probably doesn't fit his style vocally, right? Mm -hmm. And black and white, or black or white? Black or white. Black or white, whatever. Or white. Yeah, or um, white. It, it was one of those <clears throat> either or. Um, quite honestly, I think it actually probably would suit Tony better than me in, as far as styling goes. So, yeah. Well, I, we'll give it a try. No, I'm, not a, I'm not at all opposed to that. Yeah. I'm to, uh, I'm not opposed so, to that. Mr. Tony said he'd give it a try. So, is that an indicator that we could get something new from Daniel Band, a new album? Or it's even an EP. EP. Things are possible. We, we constantly talk about, yeah, we well, you know, about what do you think? What do you think? You know, and, yeah. You know, so I think that I think today, and I have all the recording stuff, and we should probably talk about it. But we, I have all this recording stuff. I, you know, it's easy to record today, and I've got the church where I can do it at. Um, it, it's really easy to do, um, it, you know. So I mean, that that's that's possible. We could come up with three to five new songs or something like that that's floating around our head all these years. We always like at a rehearsal, we'll always play around with some things. Uh, yeah, hey, I got this thing here. What are we gonna, you know? And we just joke around yeah. with it, right? So we have pieces that are still floating out there that that maybe could turn into something. Um, I would love, I would love to see it. I'd love to be able to do that. You know what I like to see? <clears throat> After, out of five albums, I think there's only two songs. One song that Dan, mm -hmm. just Dan and I sat in a room and wrote together. Mm -hmm. I think it's "Here I Am." Yeah, I, I like to see us collaborate more. And, and like instead of me bringing something, Dan, we yeah. do this or Dan, when you come everything of this. Oh. Well, I think maybe, maybe get sit in the yeah. room together and and see what the, the put our heads together a bit more and say, maybe you know. But but something. even even with that and you know and and this this is sounding like like we're having this this bro really we're deciding we're deciding this you all know, this we're talking about here. this on the live here <laughs> live here um, it's all coming but like live. I would come to Tony remember I said in the last interview I'd come to Tony with a song and and I had an idea in my head but then he would take it and he would add Tony Rossi to it which would make it over the top right. And when Tony wrote a song, he would come and he'd say, listen, you know, here's the bass line I'm thinking about. So, you know, we would we would sort of collaborate, even That's though we had written a song, but it would start to have our own personalities would start to come out in it a little bit. Right. Yeah. Um, but there were, I would, you know, honestly, like we could sit down in a room together and we yeah, we could very easily uh, come up sure. with some stuff that we would for you will do it, brother. We're on, we'll we'll, go to we will schedule that over <laughs> well, the winter. We'll have to give a, a big thanks on the album on the liner. Yeah, you'll have to be on the liner. Well, yeah. Dean and Sydney talked about this little acoustic thing that you guys did. I'd be uh, really curious about doing some acoustic versions of your songs. I think that would be awesome too. We I can could talk be, about that. We could make the album with the new songs, the bonus tracks, and then maybe take some of the old ones and put the acoustic versions on it. Sure. Could so, be good. Yeah, we we'd, we'd take whatever you come up with. Trust me. <laughs> That's right. If I had three wishes, three wishes about Daniel Band, one would be a just a completely new album um, to include those extra songs if if we needed to go that route. But a new Daniel Band album, I think it'd be awesome to hear. And I love this album, Running Out of Time. It came out in '88, 
and it's a, a wonderful album, but it's an album of the times and that a lot of bands were using the program drums. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear that material with, with authentic drums, if you will. I think yeah. give it a new body. I'd love, you know, a lot of bands are re-recording their old stuff and I think mm -hmm. that'd be awesome. What about Mr. Dean, Miss Cindy, Mr. Dan, Mr. Tony? What about an album coming out live at One Way In from this live stream? That, that might be a little ambitious. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump in there quick. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it'll be enough just to live stream it, I think, you know. I got you. I got you. Well, yeah. just want to say we're heading to Scripture Closeout and um, want to say thank you all so much. And, and Mr. Dean, Miss Cindy, it's been a real treat uh, and an honor to meet you all after all these years, seeing your names, a nerd like me scouring those liner notes, and I can finally meet the wonderful people. And Mr. Tony, it's been a, an honor, sir, to meet you. I've, I've gleaned from your uh benefited from your music and, and your lyrics and mr dan it's always a pleasure to have you sir thank you thank you thank you god bless you guys bless you to uh, meet all of you, you well. yeah absolutely humbled and honored to to participate and just to share some thoughts uh, it's very kind of you to invite us to participate thank you well thank you for blessing you. us and mike is our resident minister as we say he's the pastor of a church and uh he takes us at the end of every um, episode to Scripture Closeout, keeping the main thing the main thing. When he finishes, if you don't mind, please stick around for one more moment. Okay. Okay. So what I have today is um, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking what we're really talking about here is legacy. I mean, as we're celebrating 50 years and 40 years, and as we had this concert out in Ohio with all these bands that ministered to us when we were younger and and even what we do here, as, as this show goes, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking to all these bands that ministered to us when, when we were younger and continue to minister to us. And, and all these things really participate together to keep this alive and hand it down maybe to other people who aren't familiar with it. So we're really talking about legacy. So as I got to thinking about that, I, I got to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, which say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and you when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Amen. And that's that's the whole idea. It's the whole idea Amen. of passing down the treasure that is our faith, um, keeping it going, keeping it alive, handing it down to those who are younger. And I think all these things that are happening now are helping to accomplish that. Is it wrong that I want to sing, we're going to rise up, rise up, after he said that? <laughs> I, know, I was thinking that. <laughs> That's can awesome. I, can I just add that, uh, you know, for Dean and I, the um, uh, Psalm 78 is, is really kind of our, our life, uh, some of our life verses in there. We will teach the next generation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The and actually, the deeds of the Lord. It's yeah. interesting that you mentioned that because I also considered Psalm 78, 4, which is a similar type verse. So. Wow. <laughs> I just felt at that moment, yeah. should I just jump in with that? But I think it was a God thing. Yeah. And yeah. if you would let me just jump in when I think of Daniel Band, uh, I think of 2 Corinthians 4, 2, although it could be 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Um, it is required of a steward uh, that he be found faithful. And, mm -hmm. and I think the stewardship of Daniel Band, the guys in the band, their faithfulness is uh, immeasurable. And uh, that's why God used them. Mm -hmm. uh, they just did what they needed to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's incredible. Yeah. Thanks, Dean. Thank you, bro. Thanks, yes. bro. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You feel the same about you? Thanks. Appreciate that. Love you guys. So, friends, we're going to sign off and, uh, again, uh, want to give all glory to the Lord for his blessings. And uh, I know that 
Ben Dale and One Way In have been a blessing. The Lord's used them as a blessing to Daniel Band. And Daniel Band uh, has been a blessing to us. And we hope friends like, like Mr. Dean and Miss Cindy and Mike were talking about, we hope to pass that torch along and to be a blessing to others who might see this program. And, um, you know, all glory to, uh, you know, to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, for he is worthy. Um, so with that, friends, thank you for watching. Thank you, Dean and Cindy and Dan and Tony and uh, take care, you. everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.